Poutine here once again on It's Cup of Time for a very special edition. Today, when I'm filming, it's August 5th, 2022. And that is exactly one year since I received the full set of the wonderful Peisty Bronze Gongs. As I said before, a year ago and half a year ago when I did a report on my six months of using them, I said at 12 months I would do another video and give you my impression of everything. So it's been quite a year. It's been very exciting. It's been really amazing. I love these gongs and I've used them all the time in my videos as you have seen. I use them all the time in my live sessions and I just come here to my studio and play them because they're a lot of fun. So I really like them. As my good friend Mike Tamburo commented, he felt like these gongs were specifically made for me. And that's actually how I feel. These are the gongs I have always wanted for years and years and years. And getting the whole set plus one extra, I have eight of them. I have two number nines, if you've been following along. Getting the whole set has been just amazing. I really love these gongs, and I keep finding new sounds in them, even after a year. I continually play them with different mallets, different flumey, doing different things with them, combining them with bells and bowls and other instruments and just finding new sounds and rhythms and especially new inspiration with these gongs. They are really fantastic. So that's my take on them. I know a few other people who have the full set of all seven gongs and you might be out there thinking well should I buy a full set of those and my recommendation would be for most people no. Besides the cost factor, it's just, you would really have to have a need for all these different sounds. I would suggest, I think that one or two of these would make a great addition to anybody's setup. Because they offer some very unique sounds not heard anywhere else. So, yeah, that'd be great. You know, I could recommend adding one. If you want a dark gong, get the number zero or the number nine or the number one. They're very dark sounding. That could be a good place if you want to add some darkness. If you want some real focus, uh, number two or number eight, even number six are very focused. Number four also, um, they all can have a very focused middle tone, yet yield a really nice crash when played more towards the edge. A lot of flexibility there. So how have I been using them? Again, if you've been watching my gongs in the videos, recent videos, you can see some of the setups I've been using. My main setup Normally I would have my 32 inch symphonic here and I've mainly been using the number zero, the number six here, the number two here, and one of the number nines here. Currently I've been using the original bronze gong I got, the first number nine that I got at Andy's Music a year, almost a, well, a little over a year and a half ago. So this is my first one. It's a little higher pitched than the number nine that came with the set. So I will kind of switch them out now and then. They both have the same sort of number nine character, but there's a definite pitch difference. So currently I've been using the higher pitched one because uh, I've been using, I mean, with this one and this one with the zero, and the six, there's a lot of darkness there, so I didn't want to add really more bottom end. So I chose this one just to bring it up in pitch a little bit. And because it's, I think it's a little stiffer, it's a little more focused gong. So different applications 
I like to use this one. Although I had been using the, the darker number nine for quite a while. But again, I just kind of wanted to bring the bottom end up a little more and add some focus. So the, the really amazing gongs. As far as the pitches, the pitches haven't changed dramatically in the past year. A couple of them might have moved a little bit. Taking my tuner to all the gongs, they have pretty much stayed the same pitches over the past year. But what has changed is the response of the gongs. A couple of them have just really opened up for me, especially the number eight. When I first played this, and you could probably go back on my original videos from a year ago, it was very stiff and just yielded just kind of a uh, kind of a short, stiff sound in the middle. After working with it and playing it, and as I tell everybody, when you get a new gong, you got to play it and you know, get that metal moving and vibrating so it breaks in. Uh, it's got a much better sound that has a little more overtones to the middle and it's not as muted as it was originally. And then out here on the spokes, it's starting to really get some nice harmonics that add to it. So the gong has opened up a lot. It's still very stiff because of the, the spokes or rings but not as stiff as when I first had it and it just didn't make much sound at all. So it's a beautiful gong. I took it to my session last weekend in place of the number two because they both have that very focused center. So I switched it out and it sounded great. Worked well with all the other gongs. And that's one thing I found too. I have Feisty gongs from all the series. I have Planet gongs, Symphonic gongs. I have all the Accent gongs. I use the 22 inch Accent a lot in my setup. It's normally kind of where this one is. And the Bronze gongs, they, they play well with all of the Feisty gongs. And I've used them with Chow gongs, Wind gongs, Sun gongs, and other Chinese and Asian gongs. And they work well with those too. So why don't I just do some playing, kind of experimenting around, different mallets, different stuff, and we'll just get some different tones happening and you can listen for yourself. A couple of things that I have changed. One is I really prefer to use a heavier mallet because the bronze is much stiffer than the nickel silver and these gongs seem to take a little more oomph, a little more weight to open up. So I'm generally using my really heavy mallet here. That is an old Balter GM2 that I put fur on and I like that. Even when I'm playing soft strokes I like to use this one because I just feel that extra weight really helps with the bronze. Another really important thing, if you go through my past videos and my blog and questions on Facebook and all, people ask me about priming the gongs. Now for those of you who don't know what priming is, it's an orchestral technique where you get the gong vibrating by just tapping it slightly, just to get it vibrating so that when your note comes to hit the gong, you know, in the symphony and everything's going along, you hit the gong, it speaks. If you don't do that, you hit the gong, you kind of get a wah, you get a delayed crash there. So I haven't been priming my gongs in the past. One reason I said is because I'm moving around so much, I don't really have time to do that. But I found that with these gongs, and especially a couple of them, like the the six, the eight, excuse me, the six, the eight, the two, um, they do benefit from priming them. So like on the six here, I'll just lightly tap it. I can hear it vibrate. People out in the audience can't hear it, but I'll just tap it lightly so that when I strike it, it opens up right away. Other 
otherwise, again, there can be that sort of delayed hit, and it's like, wah, and then it opens up. But I'd want it to be like, wah, right away. Same thing with like the number eight or the number six. I might just give it a little tap, and then the sound is right there. Now something like the zero and the one, very thin, very responsive. The nines also, I don't tend to have to prime those. Another tip about priming is playing flumey. When I go to play a flumey on these, I tend to tap them maybe two or three times on the back rim. Again, nobody can hear that out front, especially if there's other sounds going on. And what that does is, again, it gets the gong vibrating. Whereas if you take a flumey, let's take this here, and just go on a dead gong, sometimes, you know, it might take you a while to get it going, especially like the six here. Let's move over to this guy here. So if I just start, Okay, now the sound's starting, and I started up here. Whereas if I get it vibrating, I have it in motion. Okay, the sound started here as opposed to down here. So that's just a little tip. Flumies on these, tap the back rim a couple times with your finger just to get the gong vibrating because then you can jump right in and it will start singing for you. Other than that, I haven't changed any techniques. Those are the only two things I've really had to change. It's just, again, they seem to be stiffer than the counterparts in nickel silver so they need a little more oomph the bigger mallet the way I play and I like to just get them vibrating before trying to get a big crash or to play the foomies okay let's just play around I'll let you hear some of the sounds maybe I'll just go through them one at a time so you can kind of get the idea or you know I'll take them in order let's try that Okay, here's number zero. I love this gong. This gong is like, I said, this, is, this gong was made for me. This is a, a most amazing, responsive gong. It's dark, but it has a lot of nice overtones in that. probably become my go-to bronze gong because I always put my main two gongs right here. So I have my 32 symphonic and the number zero. Those are kind of my go-to gongs. And those two work really well together. The symphonic and this, they have a, a really nice relationship. Let's look over here at the number one. Very similar sound. Um, even the pitches are very close on mine. So I've heard pairs where the pitches are very different. This one's got the, the brilliant finish, but it's very similar. in sound, in pitch, 
The response is different and the overtones are different, but the pitch is pretty close. So I normally wouldn't bring both of these out to the same gig. I would you know, pick one or the other to give me that sort of a sound. So that's zero and one. Let's look at number two. Number two is astounds me. Uh, I've I never imagined a gong like this ever. It's just so beautiful and there's just, and I don't know, it totally fascinates me. I would think it's the, the zero and the two are, are my two favorites. They've just really captivated me. So like I said, I usually just give it a little prime here and you get just such a nice deep solid sound in the center. dark and it's got that never a high ring in there. Now if I play it on the edge it really blooms. portal gong and I use it for opening transitions into other sections of my session. It's just really great for that. Let's look at number four. I should mention zero and one are both based on the old sound creation number three earth and two and four are based on the old sound creation number four water. Now number four is the gong I'm still struggling with. It just, it hasn't quite captivated me yet. I still need to work with it. It has an intriguing solid center. dark sort of older chow crash here. So I do love the crash. I, I wish the center was a little more responsive like my sound creation water gong which has a, a really nice tone in the center this one just i don't know it just doesn't quite do it for me with a harder mallet you can get a little more solid tone out of it so i'll keep working with it and maybe i can just keep hoping it'll loosen up a little and then just be like yeah there it is Okay, from four we go to number six based on the symphonic. And as I have said in the past, I think it's very similar to a 28 inch planet gong, like my Jupiter planet gong, because it's very stiff in feel. It has a nice solid center with a deep pitch. Comparably, the bronze is deeper than same size nickel silver. So you get a nice solid and you can hear it, it wants to open up but it, it, it stays focused. Now if I move down we'll get a nice bloom here. But it's still I think more focused than a 28 inch Symphonic. And you'll notice it doesn't have all those white noise highs that we're used to from a nickel silver gong. 
Okay, number eight, the strangest gong of all of them. It has these concentric rings which really stiffen the face up. And as I said earlier, when I first got this, it was very almost muted. It only had a center tone and it was sort of muted. It didn't speak much, but it's opened up a lot. So it's got a beautiful solid center. And you can hear there, there's some overtones happening there. But it's very dark, mysterious. But those rings keep it focused. They don't allow the gong to splash out, to open up. Now if I move out on the rings, I get a really nice sound that opens up some. said to my videos from a year ago listen to this one it's very stiff very muted and back then I was like ooh I didn't you know I was like whoa what's up with this because I'd heard other number eights that just bloomed right away and had all kinds of great overtones in that but I've been working with it keep playing it. Uh, like I said, I used it on the gig the other day and it was really great. It sounded wonderful with the whole setup. So keep working with it. I'll keep working with number four here. Hopefully I can get that to open up more. Now let's look at number nine. As I said earlier, I've got two number nines. This one I call number nine A. This came with the setup a year ago. This is number 9B. I got this 20 months ago when I opened up the crate at Andy's Music in Chicago and tried out all the gongs. This one's very loose, very dark. This one's got a, a bit higher pitch and a little stiffer. So they work in different situations. So let's play the older one, or the one I got first, 9B. opens up and blooms. very much of old Chinese chow gongs I've played. I mean, we're talking like 100-year-old Chinese chows, 80-year-old ones, you know, just early 20th century chows that really have that dark, loose quality. So here's 9A, a little brighter in pitch, a little different, not quite as loose. There's about the same force that I hit this one with. You hear that opens up a little easier. Right. 
amazing sort of crash. thought had been, oh, I'll, I'll sell one of these, keep my favorite one, and sell the other one to help pay for all this stuff. But they're so different, and as you can see, both in pitch and response, that it's like, yeah, they're, they're, they're both number nines, but they're like two different gongs because of their differences. So they work well in different sort of... Um, Types of music and occasions and that. So I've kept them both. Here we are a year later. I've still got them and they work out well. So there's just kind of a quick tour to give you the individual sounds. Now I'll, I'll play a little. We'll just kind of get things going and explore some sounds.
So there you go. My Peisty bronze gongs, one year old now. Or at least I've had them one year. The gongs are much older than that, but I've had them for a year. As you can hear, a lot of darkness. The bronze is very dark. That's why I always like to mix in a few nickel silver gongs or something else just to bring out that higher end and bring out that high sort of white noise shimmer that you get with the nickel silver that is not present in these gongs at all. A lot of lows and mids where the nickel silver ones tend to be more mids and highs with some lows. So that's the Peisty Gong Report. Bronze gongs. I love them. I been very happy with them over the past year. Again, I urge you to check them out. Maybe add one or two to your setup just to give you that very, very different voice that they present. B8 bronze gongs. They go well with nickel silver gongs, with B20 bronze gongs, with aluminum gongs, with titanium gongs, and steel gongs. They fit with everything. So thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this special one year anniversary report on the Peisty Browns Gongs. We will see you on the next episode of It's Cup of Time.